Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Chapter 8. <coughs> Stamps, Arkansas was Chitlin Switch, Georgia. Hang em high, Alabama. Don't let the sun set on your here, nigger, Mississippi, or any other name just as descriptive. People in Stamps used to say that the whites in our town were so prejudiced that a Negro couldn't buy vanilla ice cream, except on July 4th. Other days he had to be satisfied with chocolate. A light shade had been pulled down between the black community and all things white, but one could see through it enough to develop a fear, admiration, contempt for, for the white things. White folks' cars, white glistening houses and their children, and their women, but above all, their wealth that allowed them to waste was the most enviable. <clears throat> they had so many clothes they were able to give perfectly good dresses worn just under the arms to the sewing class at our school for the larger girls to practice on. Although there was always generosity in the Negro neighborhood, it was indulged on pain of sacrifice. Whatever was given by black people to other blacks was most probably needed as desperately by the donor as by the receiver a fact which made the giving or receiving a rich exchange. I couldn't understand whites and where they got the right to spend money so lavishly. Of course, I knew God was white too, but no one could have made me believe <coughs> Excuse me. before there was a noticeable change in the economy of that near-forgotten hamlet. I hope I didn't miss a page. Yes, I did Make me believe he was prejudiced. In other words, you couldn't make me believe he was prejudiced. My grandmother had more money than all the po white trash. We owned land and houses, but each day Bailey and I were cautioned, waste not, want not. Mama bought two bots of cl bolts of cloth each year. My email's coming in. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to start this over. She made my school dresses, underslips, bloomers, handkerchiefs, Bailey's shirts, shorts, her aprons, house dresses, and waists from the rolls shipped by two stamps by Sears and Roebuck. Uncle Willie was the only person in the family who wore ready-to-wear clothes all the time. Each day, he wore fresh white shirts and flowered suspenders, and his special shoes cost $20. I thought Uncle Willie sinfully vain, except when I had to iron seven stiff, starched shirts and not leave a cat's face anywhere. During the summer, we went barefoot except on Sunday, and we learned to re our shoes when they gave out, as Mom used to say. The Depression must have hit the white section of stamps with cyclonic impact, but it seeped into the black area slowly like a thief with misgivings. The country had been in the throes of Depression for two years, before the Negroes in stamps knew it. I think that everyone thought the Depression, like everything else, was for the white folks, so it had nothing to do with them. Our people lived off the land and counted on cotton picking and hoeing and chopping seasons to bring in the cash needed to buy shoes, clothes, books, and light farm equipment. It was when the owners of cotton fields dropped the payment of 10 cents for a pound of cotton to eight, seven, and finally five that the Negro community realized the Depression, at least, did not discriminate. Welfare agencies gave food to the poor families, black and white. Gallons of lard, flour, salt, powdered eggs, powdered milk. People stopped trying to raise hogs because it was too difficult to get slop rich enough to feed them and no one had the money to buy mash or fish meal. Mama spent many nights figuring on our tablets slowly. <coughs> she was trying to find a way to keep her business going although her customers had no money. When she came to her conclusion, she said, Bailey, I want you to make me a nice clear sign, nice and neat. And sister, you can color it with your Crayolas. I wanted to say one five pound can of powdered milk is worth 50 cents in trade. One five pound can of powdered eggs is worth $1 in trade. 10 number two cans of mackerel is worth $1 in trade and so on. Mama kept her store going. Our customers didn't even have to take their slated provisions home. 
They'd pick them up off the welfare center downtown and drop them off at the store. If they didn't want an exchange at the moment, they'd put down in one of the big gray ledgers the amount of credit coming to them. We were among <coughs> excuse me. We were among the few Negro families who weren't on relief. I know she said not on relief. But Bailey and I were the only children in town proper that we knew who ate powdered eggs every day and drank the powdered milk. Our playmates' families exchanged their unwanted food for sugar, coal oil, spices, potted meat, Vienna sausage, peanut butter, soda crackers, toilet soap, and even laundry soap. We were always given enough to eat, but we both hated the lumpy milk and mushy eggs, and sometimes we'd stop off, stop off at the house of one of the poorer families to get some peanut butter and crackers. Stamps was as slow coming out of the Depression as it had been getting into it. World War II was well along before there was a noticeable change in the economy of that near-forgotten hamlet. One Christmas we received gift, gifts from our mother and father who lived separately in a heaven called California where we were told they could have all the oranges they could eat and the sun shone all the time. I was sure that wasn't so. I couldn't believe that our mother would laugh and eat oranges in the sunshine without her children. Until that Christmas when we received the gifts, I had been confident that they were both dead. I could cry any time I wanted to by, wanted by picturing my mother. I didn't quite know what she looked like. Lying in her coffin, her hair, which was black, was spread out in, on a tiny little white pillow. Whoops. And her body was covered with a sheet. The face was brown like a big O, and since I couldn't fill in the features, I printed mother across the O, and tears would fall down my cheeks like warm milk. Then came that terrible Christmas with its office, awful presence, when our father, with the vanity I had to find, I was to find typical, sent his photograph. My gift for mother was a tea set, a teapot, four cups and saucers and tiny spoons, and a doll with blue eyes and rosy cheeks and yellow hair painted on her head. I didn't know what Bailey received, but after I opened my boxes, I went to the backyard behind the china berry tree. The day was cold and the air was clear as water. Frost was still on the bench, but I sat down and cried. I looked up and Bailey was coming from the outhouse, wiping his eyes. He'd been crying too. I didn't know if he also told himself they were dead and had been rudely awakened to the truth or whether he was just feeling lonely. The gifts opened the door to questions that neither of us wanted to ask. Why did they send us any away? And what we, did we do so wrong? So wrong. Why at three and four did we have tags on our arms to be sent by train alone from Long Beach, California to Stamps, Arkansas with only the porter to look after us? Besides, he got off in Arizona. Bailey sat down beside me and that time didn't admonish me not to cry. So I wept and he sniffed a little, but we didn't talk till Mama called us back in the house. Mama stood in front of the tree that we had decorated with silver ropes and pretty colored balls and said, you children is the most ungrateful things I ever see. You think your mom and papa went to all the trouble to send you these nice play pretties to make you go out in the cold and cry? Neither of us said a word. Sister, I know you tender-hearted, but Bailey Jr., there's no reason for you to set up out mewing like a pussycat just because you got something from Vivian and Big Bailey. When we still didn't force ourselves to answer, she asked, you want me to tell Santa Claus to take these things back? A wretched feeling of being torn engulfed me, and I wanted to scream, yes, tell him to take them back, but I didn't move. Later, Bailey and I talked. He said if the things really did come from Mother, maybe it meant she was getting ready to come and get us. Maybe she'd just been angry or something we had, at something we'd done, but was forgiving us and would send us soon. Bailey and I tore the stuffing out of the doll the day after Christmas, but he warned me that I had to keep the tea set in good condition because one day or night she might come riding up. She might come riding up. Chapter 9, a year later, Father came. Wow. 9 minutes and 54, 5, 6, 7, 
eight, nine, 